Hello there. So I'm just letting people into our room at the moment. We will see how this goes. Uh, because this is a security based uh, event, we're expecting some people to attempt to enter and cause trouble. Uh, so they will be blocked and removed and reported. Uh, we found not just open chain and not just Linux Foundation, but a significant uptake in the amount of people uh, attempting to cause trouble on video calls. If you have a colleague or someone you know, uh, please, <laughs> here we go again, another person causing trouble, um, please let me know and I will um, let them in if they haven't been let in. I'm trying to avoid people with unusual names and so on to be allowed in. Right. <clears throat> we are going to uh, start sharing the screen. This is a bit of a special webinar. Uh, we've had some unusual events in the last couple of weeks. Uh, if obviously the Ukrainian situation is um, of great concern. And because of the nature of open source and where we are, I wanted to have a little bit of a special event to allow us to dig into that, uh, to dig into essentially where we are in network security and what that means for us as a community. Now we're going to do this in two basic ways. One is we're going to talk a little bit about what's been seen on the internet, uh, what type of threat vectors you're likely to have. We're going to talk about how you can address them. And we're also rather lucky in that today we're going to have a practical case study about how uh, things can be done. Um, we've got Matthew from ARM joining us to give us a little presentation just about how ARM does security in general. Right, to get started, let's show our antitrust policy notice. We um, display this at the beginning of every meeting and it contains a link to the full policy on our website. If you have any questions about uh, our antitrust policy or anything like that, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to our council, Andy Updegrove, and get uh, plenty of help. Now, moving into our actual discussion, uh, we have several new people joining. Um, we're going to dig into the current situation that we see out there uh, and talk about what it means. So um, the threat landscape is quite significant right now. Uh, we have seen a lot of infiltration activity in the cybernetic warfare from both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we've seen independent activities from groups like Anonymous. In fact, uh, in the last few hours, Apparently, Anonymous, the collective, claims to have uh, infiltrated some areas of Russian television uh, and taken over the broadcasts there. What, what that means uh, and what we need to do about it is <laughs> not something that we'll deal with in detail here, but just be aware it's happening. There is essentially rumors that other state players are also in action and other independent actions are occurring from various hacker groups around the world. Now, with all of that noise, uh, it's interesting to note that the damage on our global infrastructure is far less than we might have expected uh, two weeks ago. Uh, whether that's heartening or not is hard to say. It could be that we're just at the point where people haven't really ramped up or it could be that this is it, that's as far as it goes. Uh, what's being targeted? 
You know, we were always worried in the security and open source domain about people going after infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, there was always the media talking about what types of infrastructure could be impacted and so on and so forth. Now, uh, in the last two weeks, we haven't actually seen much infrastructure being targeted. That is interesting for the open source community because uh, naturally we're everywhere in infrastructure and, you know, projects like the um, civil infrastructure um, initiative, the uh, core infrastructure platform. These organizations have long been thinking about how both infrastructure uses open source and what the implications could be. We have seen a lot of activity on media services. And, you know, as of today, the anonymous claim of uh, getting broadcast television in Russia, that suggests that the most traction is being made just breaking websites, uh, which is heartening, but something we need to address, and I'll talk about that later. It is noticeable that the scope of the activity on the internet is hard to define. Uh, our news services around the world are not covering this in a comprehensive way. Uh, we haven't had good information from various nation states about what's going on. Uh, in, in terms of the impact scale, which leaves us in the dark. Um, and, you know, whether or not you're watching Al Jazeera or Deutsche Welle, whether or not you're watching NHK, or if you must, uh, RT, there's no proper information on the scope of what's going on. Yep, another stupid hacker. <laughs> well, we wouldn't even give them the name hacker, I suppose, just a silly person. Right, so the scope is hard to find and we do have um, you know, something in our pocket there to say either it's bad or not so bad, we just don't know. So where does open source fit in? Um, you know, quite frankly, there's no, product or solution out there today, which doesn't contain open source. And a lot of critical systems um, from internet servers through to actual infrastructure uh, is running with open source in critical areas. So we can expect a reasonable number of, of the hacks around the world to be using open source uh, compromises. Um, and this isn't indicative of open source not being secure, it's just indicative of the scale of usage. Uh, and you know, particularly things like, let's say, one of those websites that has been taken down and defaced, well, it's entirely possible that it's just simply an outdated open source package in something like the Apache web server. Um, it's, it's something that will just be a reality. And uh, you know, when it comes to communicating that, uh, to your companies, the simple message is that the sheer scale of open source usage, usage means that the uh, amount of compromises that you'll see utilizing open source are a given, in the same way that the sheer scale of Windows computers out there is a significant contributor to the amount of Windows malware out there. So that's something to keep in your back pocket and to keep on the communication side. Um, when it comes to state-owned cyber warfare tools, and this is an interesting one, I have yet to be aware of a conflict which has state actors engaging in cybernetic warfare where the tools do not end up escaping. Um, so for, you know, we've had all kinds of things happening. Uh, uh, I'll give you one example. It, it goes back a while. We've got Stuxnet, which was a collaborative effort between Israel and the United States to create a way to damage the Iranian centrifuges. And uh, unfortunately, that ended up going across the internet and causing all kinds of havoc. Same applies to every conflict uh, we've had. So it's possible that some sophisticated tools, which may infiltrate open source, 
uh, will go live in the next couple of weeks and months. So uh, what do we need to do? Well, the big picture on security here and regarding open source is simply that the most commonly infiltrated things, such as websites or net uh, provided solutions, um, are likely to be scanned for compromises and people trying to find a way in. Uh, and in such a case, it's highly recommended that if you have internet facing products or services or solutions, uh, you should be ready to update them really fast. Uh, when a CVE is published, uh, you should be ready to move to the new version. Uh, if you're not currently monitoring CVEs and similar, uh, you should do so. Uh, if your security teams are almost certainly doing so, uh, you should just make sure that they're plugged into what open source you're using right now uh, to make sure that you know you guys can coordinate and update your websites and solutions uh, when inevitably uh, the hacks become more public and people can utilize them for other types of chaos. A secondary concern is probably to check your IoT and other essentially net infrastructure um, update processes. Uh, as I said, we've we've not seen an a large amount of infrastructure being targeted, but it doesn't mean that it won't happen. And it doesn't mean that it's not part of what's going on. Uh, so, you know, whether your company is doing smart cities or whether it simply is monitoring things all across using IoT, uh, that's probably a secondary priority point for checking your update capabilities. I'm flagging that because while a lot of companies are on top of let's say websites and similar uh, getting patches, uh, they're lagging behind on things like the IoT security. Now we've been talking about it for years, but it's still a problem around the world. Right, so um, that's it in the big picture. We're seeing a large amount of activity. We're seeing nation state actors in Russia and Ukraine uh, doing exploits against each other. We're seeing independent collectives like Anonymous doing stuff. The scale and scope of what people are doing is not being reported accurately anywhere in the world. Um, what we can say is that the infrastructure stuff is not as visible as we'd expect. In fact, there has been no notable infrastructure attack that I've seen, but there are plenty of websites and even apparently some broadcast systems uh, falling over. So. Uh, yeah, you should be really ready to get your internet infrastructure updated as fast as possible. No doubt there'll be new CVEs reported as people dig into uh, what the, first of all, the independents like Anonymous are doing to deface websites. And second of all, what the state actors are doing. Unfortunately, as a consequence of the state actors acting, uh, their tools will probably go into the wild and uh, they, they often have pretty good tools. Uh, your IoT and other infrastructure should have update capabilities, um, and you should make sure your teams are aware of that. So no huge panic because we haven't seen infrastructure hit successfully yet. I'm just going to pause there and see if anyone has any questions. Okay. If there's no questions, then we're going to move on from the big picture of the exciting stuff happening out there, and we're going to talk about what real companies do around security. Uh, and, and the purpose of this isn't to suggest that a company doing something today uh, mitigates whatever might come in the cybernetic warfare field, but to show you a, an example of a company doing security, and probably your company's doing the same thing, uh, but at least now you'll have that image and you'll have the uh, ability to ask your security teams questions based on the short presentation we'll have today. And by sharing this case study, today is ARM from Matthew, uh, we're just setting in motion the usual thing we do, which is sharing knowledge as much as possible. Matthew, after that dramatic and exciting intro, I'm gonna throw the, the event over to you. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it. Um, is it Shane? Is it okay if I share my screen? 
Oh yes, please do, please do. Just have this one slide. If if somebody does uh, come in and and repeat what they did with you, if you can kick them out, I'd appreciate it. I certainly will. We currently have a whole bunch of them in the waiting room. Okay, so um, I just have I have, have one slide here. You can see it on my screen. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm I'm Matthew Crawford. I work at Arm. Arm is a semiconductor uh, company. Hopefully, most of you. Or have heard of the company, um, 200 billion ARM chips have been made around the world and have gone into several different products from sensors to servers. Um, and just the quote down at the bottom, it's taken 30 years to build ARM's reputation. And in less than 30 minutes, we could significantly damage it. And that, that's really just goes to show the, the world and environment that we're in at the moment. So ARM has a enterprise security team, which is looking at a variety of different um, security aspects. So that's from um, dealing with people, from technology, cloud services, and patches that need to be um, updated on, on our products. Uh, but my uh, work is really around um, the, what we, we call the third party IP team. And that does deal with open source um, products, but also has distributables um, and proprietary uh, software. So a, a large amount of the work that we deal with is open source software, and um, uh, but, but it's not all uh, open source, about 80, 85% of the um, software that we bring in is, is open source, but there's still a percentage of proprietary uh, software there. Um, and I'm really focused on one of uh, a number of initiatives within ARM that's trying to help our engineers with the security uh, of this inbound uh, software, whether it be open source or proprietary. And we're really trying to make this um, initiative one of, one of many um, product agnostic. ARM, those of you who don't know, has a number of different departments, each with their own sort of slightly different ways of, of dealing with processes. And we have implemented things in the past around license compliance, which when we try and introduce a new process, we try and make it um, possible that any department in the organization can, can pick up on the uh, work that we're doing. And in the security world, we're doing exactly the same. We are setting out a, a policy that uh, covers the whole company and then set out processes that again cover the whole company, which uh, individual groups can um, uh, modify slightly um, to make it fit their, their work. So we try and make the policy as broad as possible. And I feel that Open Chain uh, is, is doing a, a similar thing in, in this world. Now, when we bring in um, IP, open source software or proprietary IP, the idea is that it's scanned from um, as soon as it's brought in. So engineers know what the uh, risks are when they're bringing in open source software. At the same time, we look at the license and, and license compliance. And this kind of sets a baseline for us with our uh, security uh, vulnerability score, if you want to call it a score, so higher risk and lower risk things. And we wouldn't necessarily rule out something that's higher risk, we just need to put a mitigation plan in place. But there's clearly a broad policy that if there is a vulnerability that can be uh, replaced or mitigated, then, then, that, then that is the case. Um, and then the, the second part of this uh, work that we're doing is really around continuous monitoring. Yes, today when we bring in some open source software, um, it might be low risk, but of course, as we move on through time, um, vulnerabilities can crop up as technology progresses. And we're really keen to, to have that continuous monitoring. So we implement tools that can continuously scan the, uh, the, the open source software that we're bringing in for any vulnerabilities. And if there are any, then it is flagged to the product managers and they can make the necessary mitigation plan. Uh, usually that is with uh, an upgrade of the open source software or if necessary, uh, remove it completely from uh, the products. And then uh, when, um, uh, when the product engineers is ready to release the uh, product. Uh, again, there's a security scan, there's a check uh, to ensure that the uh, we, we haven't missed anything. And this is when we're also doing our license compliance. 
So this is kind of just a, a brief overview of what we kind of do uh, at ARM. We're really keen to ensure that we are contributing to a secure supply chain um, and we really don't want any any damage to, to ARM's reputation. So we are doing our um, utmost to ensure that, that we have a, a good supply chain and hopefully by contributing to open chain we can all learn and uh, 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 well, progress the security risks moving forward. That was all I was really going to say uh, on what we have done to date. I'm happy to open it up to any questions or comments. Brilliant. Thank you, Matthew. I, I have one uh, which is really an organizational one. Was it hard to tie the security and the open source teams together and make sure there was good communication between them? And um, good communication, always very important. Um, I mean, Sammy is on, on the line. I don't know, Sammy, you want to, to comment on anything on, on that? Hello, yes, hi. Um, hi. Uh, I, I, I think, yeah, well, one has to do what one can. Um, uh, uh, so um, so I think I think the biggest challenge, um, Shane, I think with with uh, with the security team, there, as Matthew quite rightly outlined, they're dealing with a huge um, uh, uh, a number of very differing um, uh, challenges from your, uh, you know, the, your network uh, security to uh, your infrastructure to um, uh, to to sort of the, the 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 software that you install on devices to so, so varying degrees of challenges, and I think you know our part as Matthew mentioned is focused on the the open source and proprietary uh, third party IP that we distribute in our products um, and and the way we dealt with sort of with the interaction with the security team um, I, I, I think we sort of brought to the table that the experience learned from the license compliance and, and the approach that we've taken to accomplish the license compliance and, and certified to open chain. So they themselves are very, very interested in, in having us on board uh, as, as, as one of their um, uh, key stakeholders to share that, that, that experience and expertise and help, help them sort of define the overarching policies and, and, and processes relating to everything that they do uh, and see where there are common aspects. You know, for example, when you bring in software from outside of the company, regardless of whether it is uh, something that you install on your uh, uh, laptop or on your, on your uh, uh, phone, you could follow very similar processes where, where, where applicable to sort of ensure that that is secure. Uh, where you're enabling engineers to use cloud services outside of your organization. Um, you need to just to sort of go to the, with that basic principle that that, uh, that 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 service is secure and would do the same as as if the service was hosted by ARM directly. Uh, so, so, you know, g going round, I think I think the the um, um, the selling the success of open chain from a compliance was definitely a key factor because we we had a track record of sort of saying we've done this for arm and 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 that sort of i would recommend that 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 if you have in your organization teams responsible for compliance to uh to sort of advocate for an overall collaboration with their with the security team um uh, to guarantee a good outcome Fantastic. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, and, you know, much appreciate the, the fact that we've got a glimpse into what one company with significant market reach and also significant exposure is, is doing in general security processes. Now, if, if you're from a company watching this live or recorded and you're thinking, well, how on earth do we start? We're, we're not where ARM is. We're... Um, we're not at the capacity of communications and processes to deal with this stuff. Uh, Sammy mentioned about how Open Chain has a lot of experience around high level stuff. And we've done a lot of work regarding open source compliance. 
Now we've also done um, work in the security domain. And I think that's probably more and more relevant uh, to our stakeholders simply because of what's happening these days. In August 2021, I have to concentrate to think what year it is. <laughs> in August 2021, we released the security guide. And this guide basically looked at the open chain ISO standard and said, here are the bits that are useful for security. And we did that for a very simple reason. People were using our standard for security and we wanted to help parties who were interested in doing that to do so in a manner uh, that was as streamlined as possible. Now, the work we've been doing has continued and this security guide is growing into a reference specification document. Uh, and I just put the link directly to the current version of that document there. Uh, this is something that could grow up in the future to be uh, an extension to OpenChain as an ISO standard. It's something that could grow up in the future to be a sister standard, or it's something that could always remain a reference document, simply there to help people brainstorm. But it's happening. And you know, if you have a look at our security assurance guide and then have a look at the Word document where we're busy building out a, a more sophisticated discussion uh, from the kind of open chain perspective, the very high level, the what instead of the how perspective, uh, framing the problem. That's happening right now. And our reference specification document, well, it should probably be finished this month. We're making progress and we're pretty much ready to go. Okay, so that can be helpful if you're thinking, how do I actually do stuff here? But that's far from the only thing that you might want to do. You may be thinking, how do I get involved with the security community? Uh, who, do I, who do I talk to? Now, OpenChain is always in basically orbit. We're very high level. And this means we don't go into the how you do things. We don't go dipping into the details of stuff much. But there are projects that do. And I wanted to share with you a link, which is in the chat, but it's just github.com forward slash OSSF. That's the Open Source Security Foundation working groups. And these working groups are covering a lot of ground. How to identify security threats, tooling uh, for security, vulnerability disclosures, and so on. So I think that's a really good place to go if you want to meet people with a common mindset. Now I see Sam, Sammy's hand is up. Sammy, over to you. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. So I just noticed that uh, Steve did ask a question and, and I'm assuming that it was directed uh, uh, at us from Arm. Um, uh, I think the question is, is uh, you know, how do you make the distinction between the scanning when you when you bring into your organization software that you bring into your organization and the continuous monitoring? We did exactly that. Actually, we divided the activity into two key areas. We said, okay, to to uh, achieve, we're going to focus initially on when we bring in or when we reuse. Um, open source in um, new versions of existing products or new products altogether. They have to go through the scanning and the risk assessment and, um, and then leaving the monitoring as a separate activity to, to ensure that at least as a minimum uh, that we're doing that, that sort of uh, uh, review of the security every time a new release of the, the ARM product is, is uh, happens. And of course, uh, you know, uh, in our company, most products get a maintenance release every three to six months. So, so that, that sort of seems reasonable step to, to start with. But you're right. You can't just you can't just do a, a snapshot, as Matthew said. It, it, with license compliance, if you're using the same version of the open source, well, the license compliance is exactly the same uh, unless something dramatically changes in terms of how you're using it. But if you're using it in the same way, then actually your compliance artifacts remain unchanged. Uh, whereas, whereas with security, you can't rely on just doing that one scan and, and one security review, you really have to uh, ensure that you put mechanisms in place, you do that initial scan and review of the security and assess that risk, and then also 
continuously continue to look at, uh, at any new vulnerabilities that have been identified for the same piece of software and perhaps use uh, some tools that, that would help you send alerts um, uh, to sort of say, okay, uh, there is a new risk identified here. And if you know where in your products it's used, it's very easy to go and say, do we need to update this as a result of this new vulnerability that has been identified? A lot of work, a lot of work and requires really quite significant uh, amount of automation to, to, um, to make it work at scale. Brilliant, thank you, Sammy. Does anyone have any further questions for Matthew and Sammy? Just pausing here in case people do. Now it's very late here in Asia, so we can expect that uh, you know our most of our Chinese contingent, our Japanese contingent, uh, and our Korean contingent will be <laughs> looking at this as a recording. They might have questions later, and they can ask them on our main mailing list. So let's wrap it up around there. Uh, we're definitely seeing a lot of cyber conflict online. We're seeing it hitting mostly web infrastructure, not civil infrastructure. But uh, we are seeing that tension, you know, potentially escalating. Uh, we do have the existing problem that state tools go outside and they cause havoc. We do have an existing notation that, for instance, Anonymous is apparently doing relatively sophisticated hacking. And when it boils down to it, because open source is everywhere, some of the vulnerabilities being exploited will be open source. So we need to be ready for that. Uh, to you know, give yourself the orbital perspective of it. Uh, you can do so by having a look at things like the security assurance reference guide. I put the link into our chat earlier, but I'm going to do it one more time. This basically shows how to use our existing ISO standard in the domain of security. We created it because people were doing exactly that. Uh, sharing my screen again in another uh, direction. I'm going to just pull up. My apologies, this is taking longer than I wanted. Um, I'll have to grab the link from another place. It's not sharing it. If you want to see where we're taking that guide and how that's becoming more sophisticated, in fact, becoming a reference spec, you'll find a static version of it on GitHub. And you'll find an active version of it being edited via, at the moment, um, a Word document that is something you can contribute to online. And the link for that is right there. Now, if you want to get closer to the ground, uh, you can definitely do so. And uh, we have some information that can assist you with that. Uh, in particular, you probably want to have a look at the Open Source Security Foundation working groups. Uh, they're on GitHub, linking into them, and you know everyone's welcome. The link is in the chat. Right, there's plenty of meat to go into other days. Like Yari mentioned, it would be interesting to learn more about tooling. Uh, yes, and we will swing back on the security topic to that. What I would like to end with is just the note that uh, you know if something goes sideways with open source and security, reach out to Linux Foundation. Uh, reach out to the Open Source Security Foundation, especially for you know really practical uh, solutions to how. And if you want to continue to build sophistication uh, in security strategy and so on, the what, uh, you're very welcome to be part of our security discussions in OpenChain. Please take our existing material and apply them, and uh, you know stay safe out there. Everyone, thank you for your time. Uh, we went a little bit over our current target of 30 minutes for the webinars, but it was much appreciated to have you here. And as we end up, I'll just give you the note on how many people tried to break into the room this time, 19. <laughs> so um, it's interesting. We used to have about one troublemaker every, uh, was it every five meetings? Um, and in the last three weeks, that has begun to escalate dramatically. So we, are, we hit a new record today. I guess there's a lot of twitchy people on the internet.
We will always direct, try to keep our rooms as open as possible to make sure that as many people as possible can dive in. So forgive us if occasionally there's a momentary interruption and we have to throw a trawl out. See you in two weeks for our next webinar. And of course, next week, if you want to be really interactive, our regular bi-weekly call, you'll find our whole schedule on openchainproject.org. Ah, Martin's pointing out there's different ways to protect meetings in Zoom. Yes, uh, we're currently using waiting rooms to protect Zoom. Uh, we're not using the password feature at this juncture. Uh, and the waiting room generally works. Um, and mostly one of the filters we use is that anyone who isn't signed in, unless they have a realistic looking uh, name, doesn't get into the meeting. But we, we did find, and this is an interesting challenge, if we introduce RSVP, our audience of new people drops by about half. Uh, and if we use passwords, we lose about a quarter of the new people. So it's, it's a difficult call of how open can we be? Uh, while also, um, how do we uh, try to make sure there's less trouble? And Mark and I will dig into uh, things like how we can control uh, stealing focus better. Thank you if you uh, can send stuff over to us. Be well, everyone. Have a lovely day and talk to you soon.